This is Movies, a podcast about the act of cinema. And with me today is Hans. How are you doing? You look like you just woke up. Good. Yeah, this light's a little too bright. It's hurting my eyes. Hold on. That's great. That's great to adjust yeah, while we're go. recording. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> uh, we've, we've, got, we've got Jack, the perfume nationalist, back on the show. Hey. Uh, I just asked you how you're doing. You're doing well. Uh, we're going to be mm-hmm. talking about, not a, not a movie tonight, we're going to be talking about a television program that's near and dear to my heart, uh, Survivor. And uh, Jack, you, I said it on the last show you did with us when we were talking about Exorcist 2, but you're like the one other person in the social media sphere that I'm in that watches this show. They seem to get 6 million viewers reliably. I haven't met a single one of them. Uh, so, I mean, well, I want to get into, because we're going to be talking about the first season of Survivor back in 2000. Mm. And did you get around to seeing the premiere to 41? Yes, I've seen okay. the premiere to 41. I've seen season one several times. I rewatched the first one and the finale. And um, the way that I started watching Survivor way back when during like peak Survivor in 2000 was they had like a videotape that was like Survivor's most epic moments. Yeah. And (laughs) it was like an hour long compilation or maybe it was like 90 minutes compilation of the season. And I remember renting that from Hollywood video and watching it like three times. Um, But yeah, nobody when you find another survivor fan it's really exciting um because you have like a whole other language i always like my parents have been proven right about everything over and over again about politics especially as you get older you um realize your parents are right about everything if they're smart and they were also right about survivor because i remember there was like a 15 year period uh where i thought it was really like cheesy that they were watching it um and then uh my like five or six years ago my boyfriend was into it and we started watching it like uh, during our like weekly pizza night and I was like oh this god damn this is a great great classic show also seeing the like evolution of reality tv from the early like brutal mean stuff uh like survivor fear factor and then the celebrity stuff like uh the Anna Nicole show and the Whitney Houston Bobby Brown one and Mm -hmm. You know, it's, this was long before it's like streamlined into like what it is now, this perfectly polished product. Uh, so you, you actually watched your introduction to the show is what I recommended to Hans because I knew he wasn't going to be able to get through 13, 13 hours, 14 hours. And we sk- like we set this show up maybe a month ago because I knew there was going to be a bit of time. And he said, yeah, yeah, I'll watch. I'll watch the whole thing. I don't have a problem with yeah. that. He, how many episodes did you watch, Hans? Uh, in total... With the finale, five or six. Oh, well, that, that's not actually that bad, all things considered. Yeah. But I wanted to have him watch the greatest and most outrageous moments, mm-hmm. uh, best of video. But that's hard to find online nowadays. You can yeah. find the, the whole series a hell of a lot easier. Now you uh, can. Uh, they're all on Paramount+. Plus. I, yeah. I assume all the seasons are complete mm-hmm. there. Um, a few years ago, like the first like 12 to 15 seasons, aside from season one, were just nowhere. Um, on Hulu, they eventually put them up and they were all missing a bunch of episodes randomly. And that's when I rewatched like the whole series and went through, uh, chronologically. Um, but yeah, now they're Paramount plus is like the best streaming thing. I have to say <laughs> that's like all, <laughs> all survivor and, uh, tons of young and the restless and bold and beautiful. So it actually has content that I'm interested in. <laughs> Now, uh, were you into other reality shows? I know you rattled off like I completely forgot that Bobby Brown had a show at Whitney Houston for a while. That was mm-hmm. that was ridiculous. Um, I, I I'm pretty into like the competition game show, so I like mm-hmm. uh, Survivor. I like Big Brother. Last year during uh, lockdowns, I I got into early seasons of The Real World, which were very entertaining, like the first mm-hmm. three or so. Uh, but for the most part, I'm not really big on. Like too many other. Re- oh, and the Celebrity Apprentice. I really enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. So, like Mark Road Burnett. Rules guy. Oh, I no? really want to uh, see all of the Apprentice, but like, can you get it anywhere at all? Um, no. It's, I have the, uh, <laughs> on like January 7th, I bought that DVD set of the first season of Apprentice uh, that was, is like this massive deluxe thing that said you're fired. It doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the uh, first season of Survivor is really brutal. It's like playing like the first Final Fantasy game or something. Like, 
it's amazing to remember how like exciting and like novel and like kind of like fast paced people remember this being because um, the first one really like the first kind of 10 seasons are very like documentary like extremely slow uh, no plot like psychological <laughs> things um and that's that's why i love the first 10 seasons best because of this like meandering quality that they have yeah i definitely have a strong nostalgia for i'd say everything up until about all stars once they did that season it kind of felt like they jumped the shark a little bit uh i mm. certainly don't mind like the the new seasons or the later seasons i think it's much more watchable than a lot of uh television programming but yeah i think there's mm. something distinctly different especially this first season which is really on its own even by the um you know you get to the australian outback the second season which was my introduction to the show that's where i started checking it out um it it still feels tweaked there's there's some kind of innocence in like strict documentary feel that you mentioned that i think is inhabited in this first season where people are still figuring out like the crew is figuring out what the show is jeff probst mm -hmm. doesn't really know what the show is just yet and it's all coming together and it culminates i think uh, very well with the finale and just how dramatic that is and who winds up winning the mm -hmm. show. Yeah, season two is, uh, that's what I consider like peak survivor phenomenon because that's when literally everyone was watching it and that has the most like Hollywood blockbuster type like plot. Like everybody remembers, you know, Elizabeth and like Colby and uh, mm. it, it that one is way more... Um, kind of emotionally manipulative uh in the way that it's like knows what it's doing now than the mm -hmm. first one the first one is genuinely weird uh and it, like people who watch it now would think that it's really like politically incorrect but at the time it was like really daring and <laughs> you know like progressive and like the way that it depicted like a a weird uh like fat middle-aged gay man just like being naked <laughs> nobody had ever seen anything like that on tv and you know you can't see anything like that now because gay representation is so curated yeah. and like marriage based and all of this richard hatch is just awesome <laughs> yeah <laughs> well that that's why i wanted why well, i saw the first two episodes of the later season well the, the new season because Boy, i wanted yeah. to see the 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 difference between them two uh and just to see what they're doing now and everything feels so manufactured everything feels so fake compared to the original one uh to the point where they they well it even feels like they write lines for them like there's a point where mm -hmm. uh what's his name he's got the name of like a like a um fantasy movie sander i think his name is sander mm -hmm. yeah uh and he and he i wrote i wrote that the line he's just by himself after he finds the the totem or the idol or whatever and he goes uh ah, what's the line oh they're just it's another survivor twist they put in our path or something like that and it's like what who why are you saying that to yourself you know it feels like okay so here's a couple of lines say one of these so that it feels like you know you're actually thinking that but he's such a bad actor that it feels very manufactured and fake where uh, as the first season everyone feels so real and so kind of scared because they they didn't know what the show was about or what was going to happen so so you get a lot of more i guess who, who the real person is there than now like even the the you know i have a trans husband and he's pregnant or whatever that character feels so uh, what he did on the second episode with the guys thing really pissed me off uh, where he's when he uh jeff pros is like um uh would you guys mind if if i just say let's go guys or whatever his phrase is Despicable, and then the second yeah. episode the second episode he's like actually um i stayed quiet last time but i do have a problem with that and just started like it, it, just, it felt like i was just watching twitter on screen and that felt fucking awful it's just like i have to say this 41 is fake in a different way than it has been for the last 10 15 uh seasons like it's been very streamlined and like a lot more brief you know a lot less ceremonial it used to have these like three hour finales and the intro and everything now it's more like fast food version of survivor 
but right. this 41 retool that they are doing it is very distressing <laughs> because even like at its worst uh in like the sort of like mid 20s uh 30s seasons um i still really like survivor and it was like immune largely to woke culture for like a good long while longer than most shows um and there have been some really good seasons recently like the mike white one which was like four or five years ago or four or five seasons ago rather yeah um but this 41 stuff is extremely cynical and his they've changed everything okay this i you everyone felt like the death knoll uh the death toll whatever um when this me too season happened the season before last where there's this just god awful girl uh who claimed that this really gay seeming contestant was like touching her shoulders and making her feel uncomfortable it was so obviously just like everybody knows exactly what this is but because of that uh wokeness hit it so hard and now they completely retooled the show and um like the from what my parents tell me the bachelor they recently like fired the host of that for like some innocuous comments made online yeah, so he's like, defending some random, like some girl went to a politically incorrect party or something. Maybe somebody pageant, wore blackface. Like a, yeah, and it, it was nothing. yeah, it was some kind of like southern ball type thing. Um, and so Jeff Probst sees that guy as the example, so he has this like just <laughs> grotesque tone of like, we really want to learn here. Yeah, we're gonna. I just want to learn. It's like I agree. People. I. I also have an issue with the word guys. I actually wanted to change it, mm. but uh, you know, you guys decided that you didn't want to. It's like, what is this shit? So, also, so, it really pissed me off. Is that hold on that DJ guy that's just so excited about being in Survivor, and this is the best thing of my life. And oh my god, I'm such a fan of Survivor. I can't believe I just started a fire and. All of that, like self-sucking about how great Survivor is and how uh, the Indian guy, you know, I learned English uh, watching the sort of or whatever the fuck he says. Just like, what is this? Like, who are these characters that were created by a bunch of producers? There They're to trying make to make the show seem that... more meaningful than it actually is. Right. This is, this is something that happened with uh, the most recent season of Big Brother. They made a big stink about the first African-American winner of Big Brother because like the final six were all black people. And they tried to make this, this is history in the making. This is historic moment. It's like, it's big brother. It's like, calm yeah. down. It's, so it, this, yeah. this seems to be what the vibe is and has been since about 39, which uh, you brought up the Dan Spilo incident where he was touching girls or whatever. And then two girls lied in the show and said, oh yeah, he was, he was being creepy with us too. And then we're later in the show also like, yeah, no, we made that up to try to get Dan out. So it's <laughs> just they it also mess. That was the first time they didn't have a live finale because they didn't want to allow anyone to speak in his defense. So they specifically had like this pre-recorded finale where no one could talk because from what I've gathered, a lot of people were defending him and the cast and were like, that girl is crazy, but they didn't want to allow that. So that's exactly what happened. I, mm -hmm. I've, I've heard this from, uh, I kind of vaguely know Johnny Fairplay I've heard uh, that was indeed the case where there were a lot of people that were planning to speak up. There was like a coordinated thing that was going to happen. And some people didn't show up at all. Like these people were friends with Dan who got accused of, uh, you know, feeling, being very touchy-feely with the girls, going on vacation with him. And then they show up to the reunion and they just clamp down on it and they have to play their part. And now you're not even allowed to snuggle at night that's what i've heard i've heard there's a mandate where you can't cuddle in the shelter anymore which is going to be terrible if it ever rains or it's cold which it will be of course so and the, the teens of the show were all about like sexy young people like right. the casting shifted completely yeah, it was around like that hot time. girls in bikinis and then like ozzy and you know like everybody was like are there aren't they a couple it was it's all about like whether people were fucking in the tents. Um, well, now you yeah. have it's Pat in it. <laughs> <laughs> it's <And laughs> the, <just> great. <laughs> the Me Too thing was not the first uh, no. recent woke controversy because there was the ridiculous Jeff Varner from season two came back and who was gay, by the way. And uh, he 
basically had his life ruined because he like publicly outed the trans man contestant just by saying it like people knew but the fact that he said it and the trans person had not outed themselves uh or made it okay to talk about it uh all the girl contestants around it was a disgusting display they all started crying and going oh zeke i can't believe jeff how bigoted you are he didn't even say anything <laughs> bad about the person uh but then he you know Jeff Varner is condemned to death because he merely stated that this person was obviously trans. Yeah. So what happened with that was, and I've heard interviews since, is that some handler, whatever, whoever conducts the confessionals was kind of goading him into bringing it up at tribal council. And he was very on edge because he didn't want to get voted out before the jury or the merge for the third time and just be a total failure. Uh, and it, you can tell he's like panicked. He didn't really know how to even bring it up, but he was just throwing shit at the wall to see what sticks and yeah it was that was really i think the first real incident of them uh positioning themselves to go in this direction and then mm -hmm. it does culminate with with 39 they kind of skip it with 40 luckily that that's a relatively pure season as far as that goes aside from the very end where they mm -hmm. shoehorn some like women empowerment shit into it and then like the one dude left winds up winning anyway and it's a complete blowout uh now this season it's just totally embracing that and you can see it in the casting you can see it in how Jeff conducts himself and the story like I don't mind some of the new editing choices but these people are not captivating like the the complete mm -hmm. casting shift that has occurred from I want to say like the Mike White season David versus Goliath to everything after because they do have a new casting director now they fired Lynn Spillman uh seems to be hung up on let's get more relatable looking people it's a lot of like flabby women and uh diverse guys and nobody really has an interesting personality nobody wants to be a villain anymore it's all inspirational characters yeah. heroes like you said i learned english from survivor cool what am i supposed to do with that for 30 episodes <laughs> it's, it's a terrible new direction because a few seasons ago they were really doubling down on uh casting male eye candy it's interesting to uh, witness like how the censorship change and the blurring and stuff changes over 20 years. Cause at the beginning, all the guys like crotches are uh, blurred. If you see anything, butt cracks are blurred, nipples, everything. And then as sexually objectifying women becomes like less acceptable through the 2010s, they start showing more like hot guys unblurred <laughs> crotches <laughs> um and then they've done this new thing where everybody is just ugly everybody just looks like a root vegetable uh it's really distressing like people want some fucking eye candy with their reality tv <laughs> it's like you have ugly people being nice to each other that's mm -hmm. fun that's something you want to st stick around for 15 episodes it's season. such a radical turn from just like seven years ago eight years ago because you would watch if you check out like survivor in the 20s for example they decided to take a bend in casting where it's like we're going to cast more crazy people we're going to cast people that you'd probably find on a vh1 dating show so you would get like people who are just almost maybe borderline unstable like russell hans's nephew i love brandon oh god that's a great <laughs> season he's Li in facial tattoos now uh literally insane he he there are so many moments where uh on his original season where he's like tamer but he's still like this this girl in a bikini is tempting me she's delilah I, we got a voter <laughs> he's nuts he's he's like 19 years old during that he's got a wife and kids and uh he's got hans he's trying to hide that he's russell who's like this big character hans who's this like iconic strategist who's evil guy uh made a name for himself in the like year or two before that he, he wants to hide that he's his nephew but he has the last name tattooed to his neck and he's just like trying to covertly hide it for the first week before <laughs> making a big reveal about it so he's like crazy in that first season but he's still kind of innocent and then by the time he comes back and he's got a little bit of survivor fame he's over the top he tries to fight like a 50 year old dude who's who's claims to be a former federal agent philip that's and then they basically like remove him from the show without removing him from the show it's like we're gonna hold an impromptu tribal council right now at this challenge everybody want to vote out Brandon 
cool, great. All right, Brandon, you got to go. They just <laughs> yeah, try they to make it as, soon him, as possible. Like, a gorilla in a cage, and yeah. just like oh, never mentioned again. <laughs> yep. Doesn't he? He comes back on his second season and he has like a confederate flag tattoo right? <laughs> does he it wouldn't yeah. surprise me at all <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah the crazy people seasons uh those those are great um also uh, i think most people consider heroes versus villains 20 to be like the best all around which i do as well because it like uses the narrative baggage of the entire show so well but even that they would never do now because they can't depict anyone as a villain right. unless it's like this crime against uh, wokeness or whatever, uh, them being a bigot of some sort. Like um, Parvati, you know, one of the best players ever, she is essentially like the femme fatale and like the her her whole uh, narrative on heroes versus villains is just the way that she amazingly like manipulates people. Cause she's this like beautiful, like charismatic, really smart girl. And she does the most incredible stuff like playing two idols uh, <laughs> and not one for herself and getting away with it. Um, but like she came back in the last season and was like all ashamed of having like, you know, been like the seductive character everyone gets older but it's just like narratives now like the people making television don't even understand drama or like what anyone wants it's just so stripped of anything yeah they haven't had a good villain on the show in a while if there is a villain then he's like it's mainly strategic related i guess uh which is valid but you don't have anyone ever indulging in like the negative aspects of their personality or trying to ham it up. Like you don't have a Russell Hance, you don't have a Johnny Fairplay type, you don't have a Hatch, certainly not. Um, and it doesn't seem like they're casting people who are interested in being in that role. It kind of seems like this, the guy that you referenced, Hans, Ricard, the dude with the trans husband, uh, with yeah. the fake gray in his hair, uh, seems to want to be like a Todd Herzog type. Jack, I don't know if you remember Todd mm -hmm. from Survivor China. I Every couple of years, they seem to like cast a guy who tries to be that type of character. And he, this guy sucks. He couldn't even pull off yeah. whatever he was trying to do in the first episode. He couldn't get out, what was it, Brad or wh whoever oh, the older no. guy yeah. is who looks. Howard Stern. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that guy. <laughs> that guy looks unhinged. Um, yeah, that, that was funny that uh, when he just runs to hide and listen to them talk about him and he just hides in the bushes. You know, he runs at the beach side and he has to come back and like lay down to pretend that, you know, he's not out of breath from listening to them, which was completely pointless anyway. There's something uh, refreshing yeah, that, about that that guy, though, because he does not understand. Like, I think he just discovered Survivor recently. Yeah. Because what they say, he, like three people went up to him and they were like, so who should we vote out tonight? It's got to be JD, right? <laughs> yeah. And he's like, well, I, I mean, you you two lost the challenge. For us, yeah. So. <laughs> Like, yeah, I, it I, seems I, like they yeah. don't have like the the hardcore like fans on the show anymore. It seems like random, uh, just like random people who just found out about it and sign up for it. There for a while, there were all these like I'm the biggest Survivor fan ever, and I know everyone's strategy type things. And now it's just this kind of they pretend people. because yeah. in this one they have that DJ guy. They have the little Asian woman too who are, well, at the beginning, like the first 20 minutes of the first episode is everyone just talking about how much they love the show and how much he changed their life or whatever. That woman that got her titties removed because of cancer or whatever, she's like, oh, this is the show I would watch every day to get through my cancer and shit like that. So it's not, it doesn't feel like it's actually coming from them. It feels like they're reading a script or just reading something to make, like they're telling you, not showing you that they're fans. So it feels very superficial, very like scripted. When people used to do that, it was real. And you knew, like, Survivor legend Sari, <laughs> her famous line about how Survivor was the thing that made her get off the couch for the first time. <laughs> and, uh, like, the people, like, just used to have an authenticity that was often, more often than not, extremely politically incorrect. Mm -hmm. uh and you just like knew that it was real it because they would allow enough space for people to like be themselves and 
uh, kind of develop an interesting narrative, but now it's just so engineered. Uh, but we'll see. I was not happy last week. I was like, I cannot spend my free time being lectured by this dude with silver hair who is policing pronouns and talking about his like pregnant man husband i just can't do it like especially from like a show that i love so much yeah so yeah. um but sometimes they do the bait and switch and it turns out differently i i sure hope to god but like survivor fans survivor has like a certain like republican cachet even it, it, mark burnett isn't he like a huge Republican? He's married to Roma Downey from Touched by an Angel. Of Weren't they he behind is, yeah. that, he's, that he's like Jesus Trump. miniseries that had like the Barack Obama as the Antichrist? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's a big yeah, time he Republican. Uh, mm -hmm. But the problem is that Jeff Probst is the one who's in control of the show now. So Mark Burnett is busy doing other stuff. I think he's trying to get more like film projects and TV shows. And I, I think he was more concentrated on The Voice for a while because that's his his thing. Uh, he's preoccupied. So this is like Jeff's ship right now. And to what you were saying before, it seems like Jeff is like, I want to learn. I want to be in the moment. I want to be on the right side of history, essentially, was what he's saying. And that's why everything is taking the the bend that it currently has now. And you, you weigh that in comparison to a lot of like, not even storylines, but just like moments on that first season. Like if you go back to the pre-merge episodes where... You have Ramona, who's like the first black female contestant talking about, oh, I've, I haven't had a white friend in years. And she's crying over that. And she's talking about Jenna Lewis, <laughs> this, this rotten bitch, Jenna Lewis, who then votes her out that night. is like, you just didn't try hard enough, Ramona. Sorry. Jervis can't swim. Jer yeah, is, sure. That's uh, a thing. Historically, yeah. a huge problem with Survivor is that they can't get black people on the show. Uh, so they have to, like now um, CBS has these diversity requirements where like, uh, I think 50% of all reality casts have to be non-white. Right. Um, but before, uh, that was a huge problem for Survivor. They had to sp specifically, like, go out and try to uh, find Black people to come on the show. Um, and they did. They've done so many, um, uh, like, polarizing like racial or like gender stunts like the fact that uh they did the one season where everyone's divided by race right they do away with it pretty quickly even in like 2003 2004 when they see what's happening but yeah it's divided into like asians blacks whites and latinos or something right that was their first stab we're gonna be a more diverse show <laughs> We're going to segregate the races. And Guess who's going to puzzles? Yeah. So that, they, they do nix that concept within, I think, like two or three episodes. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, it still becomes like at the merge, it's still like POCs versus white people. And that's just the alliances. And then the one Jewish guy, Jonathan Penner, who's like a great, like, skeevy strategist, flops over to the POC and they pick off the white people. And it's like the, the twist or whatever is a success by CBS standards. They were going to do that a second time with Survivor Fiji. And they did a 555 uh, casting dynamic. But then uh, one woman dropped out right before and they were like, ah, shit. All right, we'll just we'll just mash the tribes up. Um, which I, I mean, they lost spot. That was controversial back then. It wasn't what it would have been now where you, that yeah. show would have been taken off the air 100 percent before it even reached episode one. Uh, mm -hmm. But I remember they lost sponsors over that. Um, yeah. And you, you seem to have like more of a, an embracing of, uh, I guess, like gray ideas or non PC things. Like I'm thinking back to Survivor Thailand, where you had like the first real Me Too incident where you had Ted, who's like a big former football player, black guy uh, sleeping next to Gandia, who is a, a black woman. They have like that bond or whatever snuggling together and i guess he was getting a little too close at night sleeping and rubbing into her mm. like he and he's like oh mm. i thought you were my wife for a second i'm sorry oh yeah <laughs> thailand oh, is, that's season five right yes uh that's one of my favorites it's one of the most hated ones uh but that's like top five for me maybe like my third favorite or so even second favorite because i love how uniformly ugly and unlikable and kind of like psychotic the entire cast is i love the grim setting that great like hellraiser looking uh, challenge at the end where they're in this like gold like trap thing yeah um the, the 
softcore like Skinamax porno star like serial killer dead eyed uh, winner of that season. Uh, it just has this like grimness. <laughs> that, like the, the first like eight seasons all have uh, very distinct, different uh, flavors to them. Like season four has it feels really like Christian and like holy in this way and that has the most like the longest feeling finale where it's just relentless holiness the five is just ugly thailand you know yeah brian heidek winner of thailand he's gotten in trouble for so many things since then i believe he shot a puppy with a bow and arrow and his mm -hmm. excuse was oh i thought it was a coyote in my yard uh there, he gets uh maligned with uh domestic abuse but he called uh the cops on his wife for beating him up and people just assume he did he did that so now he's got that kind of stink on him and uh yeah he was in a number of softcore porn films before he he appeared on survive they didn't seem to care i guess uh every once in a while you will see a porn star slip through the cracks on a on a wholesome cbs program like i remember during uh, big brother nine there was a guy with pink hair and he was the fan favorite of the season and about like three weeks in it, there was just a bunch of pictures of him sucking cock on the internet just mm -hmm. huge <laughs> dicks around his face and they just had to like be like yeah that's not really a thing he's just a good guy and uh here's here's twenty five thousand dollars america's favorite all right he's never gonna be on the show again yeah so, reality shows have always like played with that where there are some very like conspicuous like leaks of uh nude material and stuff but yeah, like Ozzy is currently on OnlyFans. That's right. Uh, and yeah. he's totally just an exhibitionist. Like he he did porn before being on Survivor. Uh, and now he's on OnlyFans. And he also started doing just like professionally produced like hardcore pornography. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he popped up in some weird special, I think for like Spice Network, where it was like, the, like porn reality stars. So there was a guy mm. from... I think I love money or, or I love New York and then girls from flavor of love that were also in there. And then Ozzy from cook islands and, and every other season he's done. Um, I want to talk about that first season a little bit more because revisiting it, there was another thing too that ha Jervis is such a great character, you, you, you know, in, in the episode right before the merge, he's talking about how women are no smarter than cows. He's making all these misogynistic jokes by the campfire. And then he he's able to just dodge all of that. They wind up putting the blame on Joel, who's like a big, uh, like hulking uh, gym trainer. And he winds up getting voted out because of that. Because Jervis is one of these like <laughs> slick characters who just manages to slip through the cracks. He avoids the blame. And he's also one of the, the few characters they brought back from um, those early seasons into a later season who does extremely well. Like, uh, I, I, do you remember uh, the Blood vs. Water season, Jack? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... I remember he, when he comes back, yeah. Yeah, and he's just, like, much more annoying. He's essentially the same guy he was in that first season. Um, but I would say, like, most of the people from season one, when trying to adapt to the new game, wind up failing. Like, Hatch is fun on the second time around, but he's not really... Like, you kind of see that a lot of that was, I think, being in the right place at the right time for him. Uh, Rudy is like 78. He's about to die in that season. I think he hurts his ankle and they vote him out fairly quick. Sue Hawk quits because she like Hatch rubbed his dick on her or something during a challenge. Oh, yeah. She blames Jeff. Uh, that's another Me Too incident, I guess, yeah. that just went went right over the radar. Um, and then and Jenna it's like Lewis. The, the loud, like white trash, like a uh, woman doing the Me Tooing of a yeah. gay man. It's a very unusual scenario. It's a, it's a very unique, I think I, people have stated that she was just looking for a payout. She wanted to get out of there and uh, see if she could up her. I mean, everybody was getting paid well for that all-star season too. I think the, the first person voted out was getting 25 grand as opposed to the usual, like $2,500. So uh, she really milked that incident and they seemed fine with her afterward. Like she appeared at the reunion. She was doing the 10 year anniversary special around the time of heroes versus villains. So uh, just their approach to how they wanted to handle a lot of these things seemed much more moderate by comparison, where now you, you, they probably won't even ever mention Jeff Varner again for what he did uh, mm. during Game Changers with the Zeke incident. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tina was another one that was totally useless when they brought her back way later. She yeah. She just kind of stands there. 
<laughs> yeah, she was she was much older. She was like almost pushing sixty at that point. Like she got mm-hmm. voted out first in All Stars. They bring her back for Blood versus Water, but she's just there essentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the characters that were good on that season, I think, got dispatched pretty early. Um, like Brad Culpepper, uh, who a lot of people had a problem with, or Jervis's uh, niece, or Colton from from One World, who quits the show and he just makes a big fight. He's he's throwing tantrums left and right, and then bows out before like the show even really begins. Um, that was one of the, I think the last like really good seasons. That Kagayan with um, Tony Vlacos, the the cop who wins the show and winds up becoming the the second ever winner with Winners at War. Uh, that's another great like later season, but it definitely seems like there has been a, I, I guess a fall off point from everything that does follow game changers and not just with like the PC stuff. I think the game feels a little more like they're trying too hard to produce some kind of interesting result when I think sometimes you get the most interesting results, just letting people figure things out and uh, create new game dynamics on their own. Another disappointing thing about 41 is that they're making this big deal of uh, starting over and making the game difficult again, where, you know, in the early seasons, they totally starve them and like torture them. And in the last like 10 or 15, nobody even loses any weight. They're just sitting on logs and eating rice, basically. So they've made the game more difficult, but they've added these ridiculous bells and whistles, which I've always hated. They had the opportunity to strip all of that away, even immunity idols, which they didn't have until what, like 12, 15? Right. Um, They could have gotten rid of all of that. And instead they made it more complicated and more tricky. And it's so like boring to follow that kind of stuff. And I also absolutely hate the um, thing from the last 10 seasons where they all get up at tribal council and start whispering to each other. Like that should be against the rules. It's so, Mm -hmm. it's so annoying, but Jeff loves it. He's always like, this is the, this is how you play survivor. It's like, now they just do it for attention. That was very, (laughs) that was very jarring uh, because that happened on on the the 41. I was like, why are they whispering to each other? This is so awkward. It's just very Mm -hmm. weird for them to be whispering next to the one person they want to vote out. And then they start like talking to the person that's not even next to them to, about whatever plan they come up with is a lot it's of the, they learn to do. Yeah. <laughs> a, lo- a lot of the drama feels like the way it's shot too. It feels very manufactured, uh, very uh, trying to create like a very dramatic moment by the way they use the camera and the way they use uh, sound effects too, where nothing is really happening. Uh, that's a new addition to believe that it is. with this season where I've noticed like in some of the challenges, they will just cut to slow motion. You'll get a much more cinematic angle of like someone in the air <laughs> about to hit it. What, and mm. it's like, you don't really need to do that. Like it's, it's dramatic on its own that they're, if you're invested in the characters, then there's going to be natural stakes to that. You don't need all these, uh, you know, little tweaks to try and improve it. They've but yeah. totally changed the, uh, the style of like a lot of it. Uh, they've done a, uh, what I call a neoliberal uh, makeover where all the idols and the decorations and everything are stripped of any of the kind of like Orientalist, like islands uh, type ethnic looking stuff. Like the idol is like goofy looking now. Um, It's like a cartoon thing. It's just very stripped down. The music also is no longer the like epic sweeping uh, kind of sincere music. It's this sort of like ironical, it's just very different (laughs) they've Mm -hmm. changed the style when did they stop using the the original song with the chants because i love that shit like i was just telling lower is that i had it stuck in my head before we started recording this just the the chanting but that that's not was that well it's been a minute i I remember the original excuse was oh we want to fit more more of the show into it so we're going to get rid of the theme song so you would get it like at the beginning of the season and then they would just cut it out and do like a previously on survivor thing so i that was maybe what like 10 years ago five years ago yeah i don't back. remember a full credits sequence in a long time yeah so, so that got clipped and it seems like they're pretty hung up on not doing themes anymore they're just going to have it take place in fiji it's going to be a numbered thing from now on and the game dynamics are going to be what the selling point is i guess i don't know i uh, i don't see it 
sticking around or maybe they'll just send it like directly to Paramount Plus at a certain point because I don't see this show I don't see it lasting but I also don't see it getting canceled in the current state that it's in Mm. it seems a little too cheap to do like you could just perpetually spit out seasons constantly around the clock and I don't think it would cost CBS a dime especially the way they're doing it now where it's so scaled back compared to normal they're not you know looking for reservations in in China or Uh, Gabon or any of these like interesting locations that were so much part of the show I think during those first 10 years or 20 seasons of programming um, that would be as much of a selling point as whatever twist or uh, you know anything else related to that yeah there they would be so different from season to season like there was that one that was in I think Mexico where they were like around the Aztec pyramids and it was like 125 degrees like in the jungle every day and that looked like the most like torturous difficult season of all but now it it's all just the same kind of same fiji island where they just go it's it's very bland it's very boring and i mean their excuse for not doing a winter season before sending sending them to like antarctica or wherever doesn't fly now because it's like oh well people want to see beach bodies they want to see people in shape looking good not and these like, people though. No. <laughs> so now the you. girls yeah. all wear those like horrible gray, like knee length, uh, like yoga pant things that look so dirty and like soiled and disgusting. Like there was a, that one girl like two seasons ago who wore nothing but the gray sweatpants and it just looked like she was wearing a filthy diaper the whole time it was like how do you have no dignity like <laughs> girls used to be so hot on this show <laughs> and she wasn't even bad looking she just looked looked like a pig because of what she was wearing well uh, this the the um just something that i hate whenever they push the you know women usually do this so i'm gonna uh which is what it's bad did on that episode instead of voting like they voted out the guy instead of voting the the lady that's obviously going to always make them lose every challenge yeah, because she yeah. sucks at everything uh but it's a it's a lot of like well girls stick together or whatever mm-hmm. even though you know she's the reason why you're losing and you're never they gonna still get do that but the whole show, the women, when they're making alliances, they're always like, we need to take this back from men and show them that a woman can win. Women always win the show. It's always like a <laughs> mousy brunette that no one noticed that just sticks around like the goat. That's the type that historically most often wins the show. It's not like uh, the the straight guys who are like good at the challenges. They never let those win because they alienate too many people or they get voted out for being good. It's always like just the the mousy brunette girl who sat on a log the entire time and didn't alienate anyone. And then she goes, here's how actually that was strategic that I did that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's always the social game. They love to yeah. start their social game. Somebody did all the work the entire season, made all the strategic decisions, but the social game is really what wins out in the finals. Because mm-hmm there's too many people that are pissed off at the person who really played the game the hardest most mm-hmm. most frequently anyway hans what, well, what did you oh go ahead well that's what makes richard such an interesting character i, I don't know uh, i'm sure they brought him back for later seasons that's exactly what i was gonna ask season of it i wanted to get okay. your take on on hatch as a winner and then also yours jack He's great. He was the most fun part of the season. He was such a catty bitch and such a sarcastic asshole that it, 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 he had a personality, which is uh, not something that you get, at least for the, the this 41. I'm trying to think, like, who's the most interesting character there? And they all feel so bland and boring that I, I don't I don't think you would have a, a, a richer than this. But in, in that season, from the first episode where... Uh, He's already saying, you know, I got this in the bag. Like I already won this uh, before anything even starts. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I just found found him to be a very interesting personality, and I was glad that he ended up winning because that other woman was very boring. Oh yeah. Uh, and and then uh, I also found really funny that what's her name Sue had that dramatic moment at the end where she's like, if vultures were eating you, or like I would let them take you away and not give you water, or whatever the fuck. It's like, Snakes what is this shit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Such an iconic but, TV. I love that he said, oh, yeah, I got this in the back while he's just like sitting and doing nothing on the beach. Everybody's yeah. looking around him. <laughs> no, he's lecturing them. No. 
the whole time he's just pudgy, like out of shape, but, but oh. still uh, thinking of himself as like a prince that's just managing people from from afar. He was great. I, I enjoyed him a lot from what I saw of him. I, I, again, I don't know what he does when they bring him back. I, I think you mentioned that he doesn't really do that much, but he doesn't really do that much here and doesn't really take that much for him to steal the show. He's so awesome. The fact that he just straight up <laughs> didn't pay taxes on that million dollars that he oh, got yeah. <laughs> for a season of Survivor and then went to prison is so Chad. Uh, yeah, he's he can do it all. He's like a isn't he like a military guy too? Yeah, I, be I, I believe I believe he was in the service before uh, doing Survivor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he's like he's like a masculine like tough guy he's also like physically adept and like not squeamish you know it's he genuinely like breaks stereotypes at the time not that that matters uh right. but i love that he befriends uh R rudy the the, the quote-unquote homophobe um but like the uh his whole thing uh just being this like undefinable character uh and the nudity it just would never happen now it's so interesting uh the like villainous but likable confidence right. and just the fact that he's clearly so much more intelligent than everyone else on that season the way that everybody else is just like a you know they're like mortally offended at the idea of like alliances or even like voting anyone out because they all at that point still think it's a survival show mm -hmm. uh they don't they don't understand the concept uh so they're all just kind of like oh i don't want to vote anyone out. oh it's mean and unchristian to have alliances <laughs> and all of this and you know it doesn't take much to be like the smartest one on a season of a reality show especially something like drag race where there's a self-appointed smart one every season who has like wikipedia tier knowledge of like who may west is or whatever <laughs> but like hatch was clearly far above <laughs> the, yeah these dumb like 2000s people and it's all it's also foreign to like jeff probes and i think the production that there would be an alliance because at one point during the merge somehow he starts an alliance of four people and they manage to get the majority when there's 10 people left at that merge. It's it's Richard, it's Sue, it's Rudy, and it's Kelly. And then you have Dr. Sean, who's just kind of like a Long Island like, oh, he sucks. doctor. He's, He's so like, my strategy boring. is I'm going to vote alphabetically. Oh, great. Uh, great. He great. sucks great. so bad. <laughs> it's a chuckle. Survivor could have went one of two ways. It's either Hatch or <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Sean. Uh, but Jeff Probst at a tribal council goes to Sue. Sue, is there an alliance? And Sue's like, uh, no, no, this is no alliance. What? <laughs> um, so like they, they're, they're still figuring out all the game mechanics and it does get down to like that last group of five with the taggy people uh, that that Hatch is kind of the, the leader of. And that finale, I think, is just so naturally dramatic with little happening. Just you have Rudy, the 73 year old Navy SEAL and Kelly doing the immunity challenge. He just like has a lapse of thought and takes his hand. And there's so much to that, that he's just like, the fan favorite of the season is done from that one little moment. And then also you have the finale and you have Greg Buis going, pick a number between one and 10, one and nine or something uh, yeah. that I guess puts Hatch over the edge or so that he said since his mind was made up and that was gonna be for Hatch no matter what. It's just a little theatrics uh, for the final tribal council. But Hatch winning that vote narrowly, four to three, like it all just happened so perfectly for that first season. You have the the encapsulation of, of the season in Hatch, such a unique character and winner. And I think there's not really anybody else who has won the show or maybe even been on the show that's been like him. So I, I think it's also a shame they bumped him off the, the roster for Winners at War, the 40th season, because of Dan Spilo touching a girl's knee or something. That's, that's a crime. That's a shame. Uh, homophobia presidential <laughs> harassment why is it always it's always the gay man it's always middle-aged gay men that they're going after for this stuff <laughs> that's what it feels like that guy was straight but he still feels like um jeff Farner or whatever yeah um yeah. but yeah the, the hat wait richard the two, rich richard is straight no no no, no. no. the, the oh, oh, me oh. too one was <laughs> yeah, a dance yeah. oh, right. he sounds really gay but uh <laughs> he's some like casting okay. agent type uh 
Yeah, he's a Hollywood but, agent. His profile picture on Twitter was him and Jared pa- uh, Padalecki from Supernatural. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he like threw that up strategically around the time that episode aired. Like, hey, look who my friend is. I'm a good guy. I'm. I, he likes me. He co-signs me. So. Oh man, the yeah the, uh, in my opinion, the two greatest and most iconic survivor winners where it's like narratively perfect and doesn't feel like any kind of uh, uh like a goat one or an undeserving like boring person one instead of the dominant personality uh are richard hatch and sandra because <laughs> San- the heroes versus villains is the most like narratively perfect it's like shakespeare like drawing on the narrative baggage of like all of these people from the previous 20 seasons, casting them as villains and heroes. And like everybody on that season is extremely like intelligent and sharp and uh, plays the game really, really well. And you genuinely don't know who's going to win and it could be anyone. Uh, But the perfect random ending is that Sandra who just, sits there on a log scowling at everyone and is totally lazy uh when <laughs> becomes the first person to win <laughs> twice and she was like that her first season i just love sandra i love on her recent season where she just quit um <laughs> because yeah, she, yeah, yeah. she didn't want to do the challenges just scowling <laughs> she's like a dark crystal like muppet character yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's perfect it's it is really funny how she does claim that victory over so many like aggressive players in that season but she just her she's mastered i think the the game of just hanging in there and like passively playing and letting everyone else self-destruct around like parvati winds up losing because of bitter jury russell gets no votes because they hate his guts and he's a showboat and he doesn't know how to shut his mouth uh but you have like so many big iconic players going down uh in that season and and you know, tarnishing their legacy, like Boston Rob, even though he comes back and they shoot, like they spoon feed him a season two, two years later where he winds Mm -hmm. up winning very easily. Um, It's a, it's a, I do agree that Heroes vs. Villains is probably like the most overall satisfying season. You get a good taste of like the entire series in that through the characters. And the whole uh concept of like editing someone into a villain and reality shows like now everyone is kind of like aware of how problematic that is but like in the early days you do see how like brutally the people that they would do that to would get treated like jerry i remember okay jerry is so like innocuous and like nice like i like jerry uh but in the uh at the time jerry was just like the whore of all time remember all the magazines just being like jerry is evil like uh (laughs) everyone hated jerry just whore of babylon and then you watch it and you're just like she seems pretty okay totally (laughs) inoffensive if you if you watch it now especially colby is much worse to her than than is what is deserved Um, colby is vile (laughs) he's a a realtor here in austin he looks crazy he's has like a bimbo Barbie plastic surgery wife oh, and he has insane facelifts and uh yeah he weird, weird I, I I remember he was trying to parlay that into an acting career a few of these people tried to do that <laughs> Colleen from season one is in the Rob Schneider movie the animal uh that's I, Hans I think you said you recognized her first and it was yeah. through that uh Colby shows up in Red Eye the horror movie with Killian Murphy and Rachel McAdams and he also hosted uh Top Shot on the History Channel which was like a gun reality show it was like a a shooting reality I don't know how they did that but that was a thing for him and he's so he's such a limp noodle on Heroes vs Villains when he comes back and he's just a dud and he's asking Mm. to be voted out and they keep him around because he's just a week old. like he should be able to crush all these challenges he's like the most in shape guy and he's losing to like five four little russell and <laughs> jerry who's like a 40 year old woman at that point and sandra in part all these people and he just sucks uh oh he's so bad people he, worshiped him at the time nobody will ever understand that now in in 2000 people worshiped that guy and they were like, oh, he totally deserves to win. And they were mad that Tina, the goat, won instead. Uh, but now you watch it and he's just vile. Yeah. <laughs> so, so stupid. 
it, yeah, if you well, that, if if you do check that out, yeah, he he comes across much worse. And Jerry, the worst thing that she does is she wanted to cook the rice a different way. Keith <laughs> is like the chef, and he's burning the rice each time. And she's like, "Well, hold on, maybe we could just cook it a little bit different." And Keith isn't having that. So then J- Jerry's painted as the villain. Hans, go ahead. That's uh, that's what makes that show interesting, though, because uh, even though the setting should take more of an important part of it than I guess if I mentioned 41 or like uh, Jack said, it feels like it could be anywhere. Like it doesn't feel like the setting is a, a part of it. So at least you should have interesting, crazy people that will react to their environment and react to other people. But like everything you guys are saying sounds much better than what they're putting out in the air now. And uh, the the I think one of the most interesting thing about Richard is that he was a gay man, like you said, that doesn't really fit the box that every gay person on TV has to be now, which is if you're any type of uh, on the spectrum of, of being gay, you have to be the gayest, most flamboyant person in the world because that's gay people now. And he's just a sassy, like bitchy, like smarter than everyone, but he he doesn't go around being extra gay for the camera and now it feels like whenever we see a gay person on any type of media they have to play into that stereotype uh which it's not good i don't think like i understand representation but when representation is a caricature i don't don't really know how that works and he is one of the reasons why he was such an interesting character that yeah he's a, a gay man but that's not who he is that's just part of who he is uh, when now, you know, if you're if you're gay, uh, you need to have a trans husband who's pregnant back home, and and also, you know, you uh, care to, a lot about pronouns and how people talk to each other. And it's just, why can't it just be a, a, a gay person instead of everything they are is that gay person? You know, representation has gone backwards of yeah. gay men. It's regressive now uh, because, like you said, okay, if they're like the super femme gender queer drag type then they're allowed to exist as entertainment uh if gay men's virtue is entirely signaled by if they're gay married to uh a man of another race and they have an adopted child in this case it's a woman a trans man um so it's signified by their like racial mixed race like coupling if they're just single gay men then they're depicted as villainous always mm-hmm. uh like you see that with jeff varner if it's just a cis white regular old school gay man then on both reality shows and in all of your hulu and netflix shows now they depict that as a problem and stuff like uh the ryan murphy like halston series and like bohemian rhapsody and all these like very disney-fied like biopics of not even gay men anyone who's remotely like their wikipedia says lgbt whatever um the cis white gay men are allowed to be what they called complicated which means that they're kind of misogynist and they don't believe in gay marriage and don't want to marry their like latin lover Uh, And they take women for granted. So it's like it's a really, really reduced representation. Like Brokeback Mountain was infinitely more like (laughs) like nuanced than anything now, which is just like silent movie villains and yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's just it's caricatures. That's what that's what uh, representation became. Just if you're this person, then you have to be this. If you're this color, then you have to act this way and be proud of it. Even if you know, it's a caricature on who the person is supposed to be or what that group of people act like. And uh, it, it feels like generalizing too, because, uh, you know, I, I know gay people that are not like that. Where is their representation? You know, when, when they're not villains and it's just a person whose sexuality is a part of them, but it's not who they are entirely. Uh, and now it seems like everything is just like, okay, well, a stereotype of this and a stereotype of that and that's representation because hey that's in the show but if you really pay attention to it it's more offensive than just saying yeah I'm, I'm gay but so what you know and you don't really get that entertainment in you well the the shadow cabals uh, the focus groups and the board of directors 
uh, all the people in power now straight up tell uh, gay men that being a regular cis white gay man, it, gay man is not uh, profitable anymore that they can't sell it they did this is what they did with mark jacobs is like lvmh basically sat him down and told him we can't sell regular gay men anymore so you see mark jacobs like wearing wigs and leaning into this like gender stuff now it's it's a pathetic charade he's like 55 years old um <laughs> and it's all like calculated because they they have to have something a pink wig to signify that you're a harmless clown and you're not one of the bad guys do you think that uh, with this season 41, that maybe because they've been off the air for like about a year now, uh, they're going to try and get everything out of the way as far as that goes with this season and then take it easy on the next season, even though they have this casting initiative that goes across the board for all the CBS shows, which is 50% by POC? Or do you think this is just going to be part and parcel with how the show is now like it i mean that's been the case i guess with a with a ton of shows and movies and everything else they're just so hung up on it they can't stop that compulsion to integrate that um but i to what we were talking about before it seemed like there's breaks and pauses with survivor anyway with even 39 where there was so much of the social justice oriented shit there's still windows where it goes back to being a normal show and then you go to 40 and it's basically a clean season as far as that goes before now we're here with 41 and it mm -hmm. seems like back-to-back -back episodes chock full of that um i feel like this is a crackdown that's going to last and it'll be like that forever the same thing happened to project runway which uh used to be really one of the greatest reality shows of all and like survivor had a really like different interesting like on PC people on it. And the winner of the first season was like a uh, like trailer trash uh, gay man who wore like Confederate flag hats and called women feminazis. Um, and then Me Too happened. Weinstein was behind all of Project Runway. His wife, Georgina Chapman, like hosted the spinoff. So they had to scrub him from all of it. Heidi and Tim left. So no one, none of the original people are there. And in the meantime, uh, models and thinness have become problematic. So the whole thing becomes this like sitting at, uh, sitting at tables, talking about body positivity and this like self self-help, like counseling fashion. Yeah. And like, no one watches this. It just like ruined the show, but it's like still going on. I don't, but I feel like that's, what's going to happen to survivor. I don't know. Christ, that, that 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 sounds very miserable. Um, yeah, I don't know. I I yeah, like I said before, it does feel like they're circling the drain a little bit. The the fortieth season felt, for all intents and purposes, like a big conclusion to the series. It felt very satisfying as far as that. And I think they maybe know that. I think they know that this is going to be commodified into less of like a proper show and maybe something more like Jeopardy, where it's like nobody's keeping track of the Jeopardy contestants and winners. And that's why they're integrating the 41 as opposed to giving it like a unique title now. Um, and also like the shorter time span and everything. I I, I don't know. I, I see it going that way where you get like a little mini version, kind of like who wants to be a millionaire or, or, or something where once Regis left, they threw in Meredith Vieira, I think, and threw it on mm -hmm. in daytime. I think that's the path this is going down. Yeah. And I I don't really know who watches it honestly yeah they'll probably do this it will be unsuccessful they'll continue dumping it onto streaming because it's a valuable ip that people will watch for completion's sake anyway but uh yeah the the epic sweeping narratives that people took so for granted uh in the early days of reality tv where everything was about like this is a new low for media Reality TV is the laziest, most horrible thing that ever happened. People are dumb. And like now, this early reality TV seems like incredible. <laughs> even, yeah, yeah. even like early seasons of like the Kardashians are like so weird uh, in this like softcore porno kind of way that just it's so streamlined and lame now. And, and it's designed as disposable 
entertainment that no one notices as everything is designed to do like it's like they don't want attention <laughs> they don't want controversy <laughs> is there any interesting reality shows out right now that you would recommend mm, i cur- currently airing i assume you mean yeah yeah yeah, yeah. oh i watch top chef still and it's unbearable like the the racial proselytizing how every single character is you know like my parents were immigrants they have the same like forced immigrant narrative forced like heroic single parent narrative they astroturf uh, diversity contestants all the way to the end every time there was a whole season that like took place in the south and like every episode was like apologizing for the problematic legacy of slavery as they were on a (laughs) plantation it's like they don't want you to have any kind of like mindless entertainment anymore it has to all have explicit beating you over the head uh utopian propaganda narratives (laughs) which tv always did but it was it was more subtle like now it's you you are not allowed an escape <laughs> no uh J- jack have you checked out any of the international survivor seasons a lot of people uh got into australian survivor last year while cbs was on a hiatus um, no i've i've checked out bits and pieces of it when i was a bit more uh like obsessive with the show i would check out like south african survivor or something and they never really seemed to nail the concept they would do really stupid things like for example um South African Survivor I think season one uh this was back in 2006 2007 they did a straight up regular season of Survivor it was pretty good and then at the final three they said and now we're bringing two people back into the game and like the what would have been the ninth and 12th place finishers just came back into the game and said hey you want to go to the final two together sure let's flip one of these two and then they were the final two of the season so you had this entire season, two people come back in the very last episode, and then they're the final two and win. They would do things like that. And that's not unique at all. I, I, I think like New Zealand Survivor or something did the exact same thing, had the exact same unsatisfying result. Some of the South African seasons are interesting because they would get into like racial debacles. Um, and that they, it was like a 50-50 split. So that was kind of different and interesting. Yeah, when um, you said Survivor South Africa, I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so some of that that early stuff is good. The Australian season, uh, there, there's that seems to be like the second most popular after the U.S. one. I think they they had Russell Hance on there for a while, <laughs> and he flamed out real quick. He had an idol, got voted out with the idol. That was the end of him. It was within two episodes, I want to say. Um, so that they also like have twenty four contestants instead of. 16 people or 18 people and it's like a 40 episode season it's just too much oh. not really enjoyable but it's a pure version of the game they don't get into any like woke or political shit from what i've seen anyway um so that might be like a decent alternative if anybody has a fix for for classic survivor i don't know it seems like everything, everything now is taking its cues from rupaul's drag race which is basically two different shows under the same name the first half pre-wokeness was a great like satire of project runway and america's next top model and then it became a massive success uh with these horrible woke gender narratives and eventually i don't watch it anymore but eventually there's just like no winners everybody's a winner (laughs) it's like Uh, every season they do some ludicrous twist where they uh the rules of the game no longer apply and it's like there are three winners now and it's everything is doing stuff like that where it's just there are no rules that's so unsatisfying. That's that completely goes against the whole point of watching something Awful. like that. I, I remember uh, Apprentice season four, like they were toying with the idea of maybe we're going to have two apprentices. We'll have uh, this black guy, Randall, who won, who won the show. And then there was like a, a woman contestant and Trump uh, posited it to 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 Randall saying, oh, well, do you think I should actually hire her as well? And Randall was like, no. 
And then that was the end of it. They just had one winner that year. Nice. That was that was done. Um, yeah, I th- I think the day any of these shows start adapting uh, two winners or uh, that's that's a mistake. That's a big oh, mistake. Yeah, it's it's like um, you know in the later Halloween movies where they're like shooting Michael Myers like point blank and like nothing happens. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's just there are no rules anymore. It's like nothing matters. Nothing's real. Um, it's it, it's a grim out it's it's very unfortunate i think a lot of these uh com- competition reality shows are really still extremely watchable like i know on netflix they added uh the mole did you ever see the mole uh no mm-hmm. i've never seen that one so the mole was kind of um abc's like equivalent to go head to head with survivor since nbc also had the apprentice and it was kind of like a good detective game show where there's a mole in this group of people that's sabotaging missions and missions and whatnot and they would do a test and it had a very similar structure to survivor they added the first season of that on netflix very entertaining they did two celebrity seasons with, with stephen baldwin dennis rodman and those are wow. ridiculous those are great uh i i miss reality tv shows that are like competitive that have celebrities in them they don't seem to do that as often like celebrity big brother both of those seasons kind of sucked uh vh1 carved out the market pretty well i think as, as far as that goes or doing like the dating reality shows i was really big on those for a while flavor of love rock of love i love new york i love money until <laughs> oh, ryan the- jenkins killed that that one whore and then they had to cancel the season over it <laughs> so yeah those uh got really gross like the if you want to know what the, the 2000s were like watch a shot at love with teela tequila that was like the peak of just like grotesque, <laughs> horny reality, just like greased up whores. And it's like a bisexual dating, fake bisexual dating show. Oh, right. Yeah. And it's all about just like doing shots, body shots. And you know, like that kind of, that's the 2000s. Um, What's the that, Flavor Flav one called? That was Flavor of Love. What, wasn't Tila Tequila right. famous for being on MySpace or something? Like she had very minimal fame. She was a MySpace celebrity and she did uh, porn and they gave her that show and everybody watched it. And then they did like a second season that was even more disgusting with two twins called the Icky Twins that were these girls who were both bisexual and both, both so they like doubled the concept and you know why don't they have celebrities on these shows anymore i think the uh the dr drew stuff where all the contestants like died it's like literally everyone that's on that show being counseled by this guy has since died <laughs> just overdosed oh the yeah. celebrity <laughs> rehab. yeah you would you would have jeff conaway from greece and yeah. taxi and you'd just be shaking it would be like really disturbing stuff or tom sizemore and heidi fleiss uh going through their marital woes and relapsing on heroin and like really grim stuff on that um yeah v- i mean vh1 back in the day very watchable very watchable stuff surreal life was pretty good for a bit uh but yeah i i always had a weak spot for the i love money show i really enjoyed that mm-hmm. or or i love new york tila tequila did you uh have you seen what she's been up to lately um around 2016 she was all right she was posting hitler memes yeah i remember that I, but she's clearly like schizophrenic or something <laughs> yeah she, she was she was put on celebrity big brother uk and then they withdrew her a week later when those memes came up and they saw her with like Nazi armbands on Twitter or whatever. Um, that was uh, that was pretty interesting and fun, I guess. Yeah, you know, she's one of the forgotten uh, aspects of 2016. She was everywhere for a minute. Uh, another, it's like at this point, uh, we have to like watch the great reality shows uh, as art for their narrative. So like watching Survivor sequentially is like really fun uh, and rewarding, especially when it culminates in heroes versus villains. Um, the Hills, which I'm a huge fan of, it is in this sort of middle period where people weren't entirely aware that like reality TV was just like scripted um so it's this like weird concept where they get a bunch of like dumb girls but it's unclear whether it's like their real life or not and it doesn't have the like interview segments where they're explaining what's happening to them Mm -hmm. so it looks like inland empire it looks like like a david lynch movie (laughs) where it's just these girls like meeting 
uh, having like oblique conversations about their social lives and Heidi Montag is really great she's like the best character on there um but yeah the, the hills is one of the masterpieces of reality to me for sure did they try to reboot that recently with like a brand it's new good <laughs> yeah because yeah. Heidi was like the plastic surgery mess uh in the original show like this she starts out as this like innocent blonde girl but she was the one who like liked fame too much and somebody offered her like free plastic surgery makeover when she was like 21 oh, no. and so the last season uh. she ends the show uh looking like swollen frankenstein <laughs> they ship her she gets i think like uh like 20 something different procedures done in one day and like almost dies doing it and then the uh. the, the mtv ships her to denver to uh, confront her parents. And she comes in looking like Frankenstein with the swollen red face, crying, being like, this is the new me, mom. <laughs> um, with these horrible bolt on breast implants. And then, uh, then that's her ending for the show. But when she comes back, uh, her and Spencer, who were like the villains of that show, they're like the same, like respectable, like matriarch and patriarch who like had a kid of the current show. So it's like really cute. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I love that franchise. <laughs> I, I've never watched The Hills. I'm familiar with Spencer and Heidi from appearing on like every celebrity reality show during yes. that 10 year period. Uh, but it, I, yeah, it, it seems like um, I, I know they were friends with, they did some show with Tyson from Survivor and they were tied for a while and they had like a podcast and everything. And then Spencer just had some kind of manic fit and left. And now they're like an InfoWars duo. I saw Alex Jones talking to them at one point. Yeah, like, they're clearly, I don't know how open they are about it, but you, they're, you can tell that they're like crypto <laughs> Republicans, like that, especially in the current ones where they're just like, these like blonde like Aryan brother sister couple like in their like mansion, like <laughs> the <laughs> only ones that seem sort of sane. Um, uh yeah it's it's great and also it's funny that like these uh villains that everyone mocked so much like had like a lasting perfect marriage like celebrities <laughs> never stay married and i love that spencer and heidi are just like obsessed with each other still <laughs> uh all right we'll, we'll, we're gonna put a cap on the show in a minute but i want to ask you one question excluding heroes versus villains and then island of the idols what which would what would you cite as the best survivor season and the worst survivor season? Um, I would say, okay, no heroes versus villains. Mm, the, the one with Ozzy and Amanda and Parvati, which one is that, 16? Uh, that, yes, that was uh, the first fans versus favorite season. Yeah, that, that one is really excellent um all the people are really interesting on, on that uh season five thailand is my favorite like weird season just the vibes are all off um uh and then the worst one uh i would say 39 well that's that's island of the i knew you were oh say that, that one so, oh yeah, yeah yeah that's okay besides that one um uh what's his face there's that uh donald glover looking black guy that won oh ghost island that one is really really bad oh the, it's the, painfully the, dull yeah the people the winner is so like just dull and unlikable um the twists are all nonsensical and lame um just unlikable cast it had a lot of like younger people like uncharismatic unpleasant like millennial types just not fun mm. to watch yeah fans versus favorites the the first one is like a good precursor to heroes versus villains it has a similar vibe to it uh they've got like one fifth of the cast to that season that's on there and there's just so much that winds up uh happening in the gameplay and the characters and there's like a crazy woman who loses her mind because she can't talk to her daughter in her head and she leaves the show and there's some medical evacuations johnny fair plays out first because danny mm. bonaducci fucking slammed his face on the ground or something during like some <laughs> drunken reality show awards uh and they wouldn't give him his pain medication that's a great season yeah uh the, and that 
Parvati at that point is just like a force of nature. I just absolutely love her. She's like Catherine Trammell and basic instinct. And she's so beautiful. This is like, she looks so much more beautiful, like without makeup, like when the show has like gone on for like several weeks. Um, she's like every girl wants to look like that without makeup <laughs> she's, she's perfect and she's just like so, she's like the cool girl that's like one of the guys that girls all hate but she's she's wonderful uh it also has the the infamous move where eric wins immunity he desperately needs it it's him and four girls and then i think Sari or somebody's like you know i think a lot of people on the jury would like you if you gave that immunity necklace up and he's like i'm not gonna do that and then he winds up doing that. <laughs> they vote his ass oh, out. They, it's the, one of the few yeah. times, too, they don't even try to, like, disguise the vote. They show everybody's vote at that tribal council just to make Eric look like an idiot because he is an idiot. That's great. Oh, with that all was... the mean, hot girls deciding <laughs> to just, like, fuck him over. That's amazing. That's a great moment. And then no one can miss the uh, Yao Man dreams. Oh, yeah that that's something that would absolutely never happen today uh the black contestant named dreams with a z uh and who's then homeless a- who's homeless and then the old asian man named yao man what do they they make a deal uh, uh the deal is that um yao man wins a car reward and he tells dreams if you give me immunity at the final four if you win it uh, then I'll give you this car. And Dreams goes, Yao Man, I'm going to take that deal. You've got yourself, I'm a man of my word. I'm going to do that, Yao Man. And fast forward to the final four, Dreams does have that immunity necklace. And uh, <laughs> Jeff goes, oh, so do you want to you wanna give that up, Dreams? And uh, Dreams goes, I'm going to keep it. And then they vote Yao Man's ass out of there. So Yao Man gets oh, man, it's like a nothing. million dollar extreme sketch. <laughs> I lied. <laughs> I love taking screen caps from that where it just shows him and says the word dreams with a Z. <laughs> Incredible. Excellent. So, so so to recap is heroes versus villains, season five. And then you said what fans versus favorites? Is Fan, that, that, a- that one is Fiji, but fans versus favorites mm. is the one we were just talking about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, all, even the worst Survivor seasons are still pretty good as far mm-hmm. as that goes. So uh, I think I think we did a good job of talking about the entire series at length. This was going to be season one. I think it's going to be 2000 to 2021 when I put it up on iTunes or whatever. Jack, this has been a great chat. Thank you for coming on the show yet again and, and getting into this. Absolutely. Anytime I've always wanted to uh, just talk about Survivor. It's such a niche thing. You've got to find someone else to talk about it with. But yeah. Yeah. It's like a releasing a pressure valve or something. You know, <laughs> it's great. Well, right. that's, the, that's the thing. Like, I wrote those down because, like you said, uh, all of these reality shows that you can never do anymore because of the interesting characters feel like a work of art from a time that's lost now. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's like a, a nice time capsule about when entertainment was much better than it is now. So I might have to check them out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 2000s aesthetics, uh, like the ugly digital video that they use look really great right now too yeah. <laughs> like the, the like <laughs> kind of inland empire like dancer in the dark type look that uh all the early survivor seasons have the four three before it goes widescreen i just think it looks great now <laughs> yeah the really cheap dv camp it's that's yeah. gonna come back around i think i think people are gonna be ad- adopting that or trying to anyway emulate that mm-hmm. like they've done vhs over the past 10 years i think that's totally. gonna be the new thing uh yeah so anyway that's been that's been movies for this week uh check out perfume nationalist itunes spotify everywhere you can find it great terrific show you your show has turned me on to so many great movies uh like that i probably wouldn't have given uh attention otherwise like looking for mr good bar and oh um, nice uh that's one of my new favorites also finally got around to checking out gone with the wind can do what oh. hey quick uh what is your opinion on the um the made for tv sequel scarlet have you ever seen that um, I haven't seen it since fifth grade. I loved it as a kid. Um, I have been meaning to rewatch it and read that book forever because I'm a huge fan of like the 80s uh, trash miniseries like Sins and Scruples and Lace. Um, it's one of those. And it's really funny how they avoid the topic of race by sending Scarlet to Ireland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got it right over here. Uh, uh, I, I decided to pick oh, this up. No. 
Timothy uh, Dalton. <laughs> yes, Timothy Dalton's in this. Uh, they have Stephen Collins, Sean Bean. It's a pretty well-rounded cast. Uh, there is something I kind of miss about like that homey made-for-TV movie vibe. Like I, I associate that with I think because of all the Stephen King miniseries from like the early '90s, like It and The Stand. That I, you know, it's just like it sets a good mood. I think, but oh, absolutely, they're so cozy, and they also are genuinely like more faithful adaptations of those big doorstop sized popular novels of the 80s especially it like the it miniseries like captures the mood of the like the the book is such a like cocaine fueled soap opera uh that that really captures it and then uh i don't entirely hate the new it movies i especially like the second one um that doesn't have the 50s kids stuff in it or the 80s kid stuff which they mm. change but like that 1990 four hour long mini series vibe with like john boy walton with that hideous ponytail with the leather oh, thong God. that is just like <laughs> a giant disgusting like, mole on his face it eats it like that's it his face. that's the experience of reading it yeah and then I, all those books have like horrifying uh sexual content you know that they excise for the uh miniseries and then you get to read the book and find that so that, that was part of the fun of those <laughs> i completely agree a lot of people trash that 1990 it but i definitely think it captures the vibe of the book much better i than the uh the more recent one and it's very enjoyable still mm-hmm. all right all right that's been movies for this week thank you for listening